Since its creation in 1991, the Chicago Cultural Center has been the artistic epicenter of the city. As the nation's first free municipal cultural center, it's one of Chicago's most popular attractions, providing arguably the most comprehensive art showcase in the United States. Home to over 1,000 programs and exhibitions each year, it stands as one of the city's crown jewels. But before it was the artistic mecca we see today, the building that lodges the Cultural Center was home to Chicago's Central Library. Built in 1897, shortly after the World's Columbian Exposition, the space was designed and constructed to grab attention. This is a very important building to the city's past. It was its first permanent public library, and at the time when it was built in the 1890s, uh, cities across the world were essentially trying to outdo each other with their uh, public buildings and, uh, you know, putting these really sort of high decorative features and ornamentation in them, which was very indicative of the time. Today, over a hundred years later, one of these decorative features is still setting itself apart from the others. Located in the Cultural Center's Preston Bradley Hall, the largest Tiffany glass dome in the world is still a sight to behold. Approximately 38 feet in diameter, the dome spans more than 1,000 square feet and holds close to 30,000 pieces of stained glass in 243 sections all contained within an ornate cast iron frame. Louis Comfort Tiffany designed the dome to grab the attention of those entering the room, and by all accounts, he succeeded. It meets the same standards and quality construction of the entire building, which was really to build something for a minimum of 100 years or longer. I mean, they really built for the long term back then. It was a public building. It was a very important public building. Since the hall below the dome was originally the library's reading room, the more light that managed to find its way inside, the better. This situation was helped by the fact that the dome was originally protected from the elements by a translucent shell that covered its exterior and allowed natural light to stream into the hall below. However, in the fall of 1935, an opaque copper and concrete shell was put over this clear cover, eliminating the daylight that flowed through the dome altogether. It's still a mystery as to why they did this, but there are some theories. The only thing we can reason is that it was due, due to sealants. Uh, the sealant technology was fairly poor and they must have been getting leaks in and getting complaints from the library patrons or the staff here. Um, there's some allusion to that in the board minutes, but they never actually spell out exactly why they put the skylights in. Uh, and so we're just uh, believe it was probably maintenance problems. Afterward, the dome had to be backlit with artificial lights. Probably not what Tiffany had in mind when he initially conceived it, but now the only way to illuminate this stained glass masterpiece. As for the success of this new lighting system, they created hot spots, and it was a metal halide lighting which had a limited range of color. The color spectrum was pour on it. Um, lots of colors in the glass, especially the reds and the pinks and the oranges were being lost. So, for roughly the next 75 years, the dome was deprived of sunlight. And to say it lost some of its luster would be an understatement. However, it was still a magnificent sight that drew thousands of eyes upward every year. Then, in 1991, the library moved to a new location and the city's Department of Cultural Affairs took over the space. A few years later, in 1997, while the building celebrated its centennial, people inside the department began looking into restoring the dome back to its natural finishes and features. A survey was conducted to determine its actual state and condition, and what they initially found wasn't all that surprising. It was really beat up. It had a lot of uh, cracks and breakage on it, and for 
quite a while, many of us felt that that damage was caused by electricians working on the lighting between the domes. Over the years, they had added some forced air and other heating components that were maintained, and maintenance people were being blamed for a lot of that work. In total, they found that 15 to 20 percent of the dome had issues that needed to be addressed. Over 1,800 pieces of glass were cracked, and dirt had accumulated over literally every square inch of every piece. And even though routine maintenance may have played a part in the dome's poor condition, it was by no means the most significant reason. When Cultural Affairs inspected the dome, they made another startling discovery. Rough chunks of clear reflective glass that are part of the dome's panels were facing upward toward the ceiling rather than into the room. This could only mean one thing. Somewhere along the line, someone flipped the panels, essentially turning the dome inside out. We have found that in 1935, they inverted the whole dome. They turned every art glass panel below the oculus over on its back. And because there's a curvature in the lower panels, it caused stress cracks in the glass. It, it basically was bending the panel back over its spine. And that led to a lot of breakage and cracks. Again, nobody knows why they may have done this, but it's speculated that the panels were beginning to sag and were reversed in order to straighten them out. Neil Vogel, however, has his own theory. My personal belief is that it was 1935, Tiffany and the Victorian era were passe. They wanted to make the building feel more modern and they actually had, uh, they actually reversed it so that they could take the texture of the glass and put it upward towards the skylight. And that would make the bottom feel more smooth and streamlined and modern. And I think that was the real intent. Armed with all this new information about the condition of the dome, it was decided that a full restoration was needed. We started working on, a, on this project to, one, uh, assess how much funding it would take and what degree of work would we have to accomplish to do that. And finally, uh, after about the 10-year period from 1997 uh, to 2007, we had uh, raised, raised the funding through various sources to do it. With a budget of roughly $2.2 million, restoration on the dome began in December of 2007. Each of the art glass panels was first carefully removed and replaced with a translucent wallpaper replica so the Cultural Center could continue holding events in Preston Bradley Hall. The Tiffany Dome stained glass panels were taken off-site to Bodie Studio in Evanston where they were to be restored. Because of the sheer number of panels and the thousands of pieces of glass contained within them, the task at hand needed to be managed with great care. It was a very controlled type of uh, conservation process, which as well it should be. With We don't want to do something that's going to affect the Tiffany window, just like you wouldn't want to do something that would affect a Rembrandt or a Monet or a Chagall. Although none of the panels were identical, they all more or less looked the same. So the first steps that were taken at Bodhi were to record and document each of them. Immediately after they were unpacked, the panels were photographed in their current as-is condition in order to create a visual document and guide of what each of them originally looked like. It was during this part of the process where the folks at Bodhi also made another interesting discovery. Certain pieces of glass within a number of the panels were also inverted and essentially installed upside down. After being photographed, four different charcoal rubbings were then made of each panel, each serving as sort of a historical blueprint. All 30,000 pieces of glass were numbered and any details pertaining to their condition, such as cracks or the aforementioned inversions, were noted and written on the rubbings themselves. As the panels moved through the process, any new discoveries were added and updated. The panels were then dismantled. 
piece by piece, and the glass was scraped and scrubbed clean with razor blades, a brass toothbrush, and a cleaning solution that is usually used as shampoo for cleaning horse manes. Again, this is a painstaking process as every single piece needs attention. Listen, you can see the, the deep color of the, of the uh, s glazing compound, or the cement we call it, that he's got to get off and get it back to what it originally was. And, all this, and, in, and in a matter not to disturb the glass. So you can see the amount of dirt you know, that's coming off. And you can see a piece that hasn't been clean as to oppose to a piece that has been clean. And there's quite a difference. And we're not looking at it even with natural light coming through. So you can imagine the amount of candlelight that is now going to come through this window. And when we talked about how we're going to view the window earlier, we were only seeing it 30% of what it was originally meant to or its intensity. You can imagine now when we see it in place with all this clean, how it's going to look. Although the original glass has held up remarkably well, about 1,800 pieces arrived cracked or broken. Some were repaired by gluing them back together. The rest had to be replaced. About 98, 99% of the glass in this dome is original still to this day. But uh, there are thousands of pieces in there. So we still have a couple hundred pieces that we have to replace. And we want them to be as close as possible. The replacement glass was manufactured at Kokomo Opalescent Glass in Kokomo, Indiana, a firm that happened to supply some of the original glass to Tiffany. Because of this, they were able to supply Bodhi with virtually identical replicas. If, if there's a crack in it that admits daylight, to a certain point, we can actually um, tint this, this adhesive to make it look in a translucent manner like the glass. But at a certain point, when the piece is broken too much or what we call daylight, and the adhesive is beyond the specifications to join, then we have to go back to that Kokomo glass that we had special runs made of. After the old glass was cleaned and the new pieces cut, each was re-leaded and the panels were reassembled back into the original frames. Horseshoe nails held the pieces in place until they were soldered together and repacked into their crates. This process went on every day for just over five months. In all, Chris Bode estimated that nearly 16,000 man hours went into completing the job. Hours that were spent by some very dedicated and special artists. That integrity and those values uh, that the Tiffany piece represents, just the beauty of the window itself, all has to be in the spirituality of all the people building this window or conserving it. So that there's a certain amount of a relationship that everybody here at the studio from A to Z has with that window and a certain amount of respect that they have to have for each other as well as the project. Meanwhile, back at the Cultural Center, this past April, a giant scaffolding was erected in Preston Bradley Hall under the dome. Above, work on the cast iron frame that holds the glass panels in place got underway. Since the opportunity wasn't there to preserve the frame's original finishes because much of it had been corroded or painted over, conservators did the next best thing. They simply tried repeating the process. We're bringing it back to the appearance of 1897. So basically all the materials and processes are just about identical to what originally was done. The process started when the frame was scraped of any surface corrosion and sealed with a conservation gray consolidant. A coat of oil primer was then applied, followed by a coat of gold size, a slow drying varnish that binds the soon to be added aluminum leaf to the surface. When the right degree of tackiness was achieved, the leafing, which is approximately a thousandth of the thickness of aluminum foil, was ready to be applied. What you'll do is you'll first kind of try to get it onto the surface, uh, you know, to get even coverage. And then after it's on the surface, you'll later come back and burnish it out with a soft brush and uh, cotton cloths. And then after that point, uh, the next step is actually applying uh, a tinted, a, a glaze that's 
tinted with aniline dyes to kind of patina or discolor the aluminum leaf surface. So the intent is not for it to be that strong aluminum color. It's actually meant to be more of like a, a gentle golden color on top of what is a re very reflective surface with the leaf. While all of this was going on inside the cultural center, outside, work was being undertaken on the dome's new translucent skylight. In early January of 2008, crews set about dismantling the concrete and copper shell that had covered the dome for the past 75 years. When it was gone, a new frame was built on top of the existing steel supports that used to hold the dome's original skylight. This system gets piggybacked on the back and then it's glazed with uh, a thermal pane glass which will help reduce heat loss through the dome and um, also benefit the city in terms of energy, reducing its energy load on this building. Now with the new skylight in place and the finishing touches being applied to the interior cast iron frame, all that was left to do was install the newly restored panels. They arrived back at the cultural center and were promptly brought up into the scaffolded work area. Once there, they were unpacked and carefully put back into place. One by one, it was out with the old and in with the older, albeit newly restored older. So, after years of planning and months of execution, the world's largest Tiffany glass dome has now been restored to its original and intended glory. It proved to be a long process, but one well worth the effort. I think it's really something that someone has, is going to have to come to see to appreciate what has gone into um, the aspects of bringing back the historic character of it. The light in itself is um, going to bring back the full color spectrum to this glass. The dome is going to be seen like no one has seen it before. This is one of the real treasures of Chicago. If you'd like to see the newly restored Tiffany Dome, stop by the Preston Bradley Hall inside the Chicago Cultural Center and simply turn your eyes upward. You won't be disappointed.